this guy just like waves me down and goes, yo. And all I hear is, you're laughing at us? I'll give you something to laugh about. Before I can say anything, he just reaches over into his passenger side and just starts pulling out what looks to me like an AK. Hey gang, Palm Peace of Mind Industries is the OC of choice for the active self-protection team. We love their mission and the efficacy of their product. We love the flip top reversible clips. We love everything about them. They have removed any excuse to not carry OC. OC will solve far more problems than a firearm ever will and I wouldn't leave the house without it. I just bought one for my daughter and I have a good friend who used it successfully in a real life defensive encounter. Get one at get-asp.com slash palm. Get-asp.com slash palm. All right, gang, check it out. There is an accompanying video to today's guest's story, and it is live over on the main Active Self Protection channel. So go check that out if you can before listening to this, and uh, you'll be able to see what we're talking about. All right, gang, welcome back to the Active Self Protection Podcast. I am your host, Mike Williver, your favorite former Fed with me today, a young man by the name of Igor Ponomarev. And I know what you're thinking, easy for you to say, Mike. Igor <laughs> Ponomarev, he hails from, um, I want to call it Portland, Washington. I'll let him explain that to you. Uh, in the great Pacific Northwest, he's a former construction worker and now works in tech sales. Igor, thanks for being here. Hey, man. Thanks for inviting me, Michael. Absolutely. My pleasure. Um, so, I didn't know my story was special. <laughs> yeah. Hey, you know, that's the thing, um, ladies and gentlemen at home listening. Uh, not all of these uh, stories are going to be about you know a gunfight uh, or a near-death experience. Sometimes the lessons we're learning are what to do and what not to do, and sometimes how a defensive encounter can end uh, with a good outcome, with uh, nobody going to the hospital or to jail or getting arrested or any of that stuff. So uh, Igor wanted to tell his story, and we think it's a really interesting one. So that's why he's here today. So Igor, tell me, did you grow up in the um, Pacific Northwest? Is that where you're from originally? Yeah, I lived my whole life in Vancouver. I think we moved here when I was five. I'm 25 now, so okay, in 20 Van years. I grew up here. I skated the downtown streets when I was young. I went to the localist high school of all time. Uh, you know, all the classic stuff. Uh, I feel like I really have a connection with this place. I don't really see myself ever moving unless certain factors leak across the river. Uh, <laughs> so when, which they are but when you um, say across so, the river so you're in vancouver washington what what is it across the river that it concerns you so much uh so we have this little place called port Lanistan. it's a third world country <laughs> and uh every week like 200 cars get stolen gunshots all the time crime and what that does is we're so close we're like we're the suburbs of portland and so it just leaks into our city and it gets honestly really bad. It gets kind of like, I remember six years ago, there wasn't really a homeless issue. And now we have homeless people everywhere and trash. And yeah, I mean, I, I, it's I, just crazy. I want to say historically, I mean, growing up, I always thought, you know, I, I grew up in the East Coast, so I didn't know it firsthand. But we, we always thought of Portland as, you know, this beautiful bucolic green place full of, you know, kind of crunchy hippie types, you know, nothing crazy, just sort of, you know, left to center, you know, uh, kind, tolerant people and sort of a utopia. And, you know, we, we try to stay out of politics on this show as best we can, um, because I, I don't I, I don't think your average, you know, Democrat looks at Portland and goes, yeah, that's great. Everything's going great there. Uh, it's, it's sort of this it's sort of this, uh, you know, way far out kind of wacky leftist uh, yeah. thing that I, I, I think most people could look at plainly and go, that's not working. Something something's broken there. And it's a shame because, like I said, I heard it was a beautiful place. And now it's. Uh, it's evidently nowhere you'd want to uh, vacation or live across a river from. <laughs> so nope. tell me, Igor, uh, you, um, you're a concealed carrier, is that correct? Yeah, I have one. I, I worked a lot in Portland okay. and like Oregon area all around there and in Vancouver for the construction company. And so right when I turned 21, I bought a Glock. I already had a rifle, but I bought a Glock and immediately – like got both my concealed, went to a class to kind of just get me up to date. Sorry, I got the sniffles. I'm a That's little okay. sick. Um, but I instantly just like went out and I've always been a gun fanatic. So not like a fanatic, like a crazy person, but more right. of I love mechanical stuff. I love fixing stuff. I like, I just think they're marvels. So I just, I just love guns. So yeah, anybody, I think they're the coolest thing in the world. If anybody listening hasn't, I can't remember the name of the channel, but there's a YouTube channel where this guy does these graphic designs, and he um he takes you inside like a Glock, uh, I think an AR oh, as yeah. well. And have you seen these videos? 
Yeah, they're awesome. Yeah, it's <laughs> they have neat. apps for it too, like all the mechanics. I don't know. It's just to me, like, I love it when a friend of mine buys a firearm, and I like, I'm so, I know so much about it, and I've never even seen it before. Right. And I can like just take it apart and just say, here, this is how you put it together. This is how you clean it. This is what you clean. This is, because I just, I think. I listened to a few podcasts of your guys's, and it seems like I have differing opinions of how that should work from some of the people. Like, a lot of people are more serious. Old people, like, you know, they had this experience, and it's like, you know, huge thing. They're like, you should only own a gun when, you know, if you think you can handle it. And though I do kind of, I subscribe to that, but I am more of the side of everyone should have a gun because crime would stop. Everyone would know that everyone has a gun. And yeah. Nobody would mess around. I mean, there's, I think that's like, there's an argument think, to be made. There's, there's a gun called, or excuse me, there's a book called more guns, less crime, which is pretty popular in the second amendment community. And I think, I think that, uh, you know, an armed society is a more polite society, generally speaking. So I, I concur as far as that goes, but you, you said, you mentioned that you got training. So I think it's important to tell the folks, uh, oh, what, what kind no. of training <laughs> you, did, you did not get training. I went through like an eight hour class. I think John has quoted a statistic. I don't know where he got it from, but I'll, I'll blame John Korea for this. Um, if it's inaccurate, you can blame him, not me. I think it's something like 1%, 1% of all gun owners, uh, anyone who buys a gun in the United States, 1% of those people take any training whatsoever to include a yep. basic firearms handling or CCW class. So if you, if you took a class, you're still ahead of most people, I, I would think. Um, so you t you took a class locally there in Vancouver, and what was that like? Yeah, you have to to get uh, Portland, and then they have a 33 state program. And I'm not the traveler; I don't like to leave. I'm a I had some personal things happen in my family. I lost two brothers, and I just my family's here. I don't go anywhere. Like okay. I have a really big family. It was 11, now it's nine. I like I can't be away from my family more than like a few days. I'll freak. Like I just. I have to be there in case some, an emergency happens because sure. I just – I don't know what my life would be if an emergency did happen and I was gone and I couldn't get home in time. Like I would – you know, it just hurt me so much. I, I can't even – Yeah, understandable. I can't imagine it. Yeah. So the class you did take, you said it was one eight-hour class. Was that, that local in, in your hometown there? Yeah. The, uh, we have a sportsman's warehouse here, and they just have it. Um, I think I paid 60 bucks for it. They just – Gave me the paperwork. In Portland, you need to go to a class to get your concealed, but okay. it's super cheap. It's like, it's just, I mean, in Vancouver, you don't need one. You show up to the sheriff's office, take fingerprints, things like that. But in Portland, you do. And since I was working in Portland so much, I heard about the class, and I was like, I love information. I don't care. And sure. the training I have had was, like I said, I'm like really into guns. I, l I think guns are just spectacular devices. I think they're the coolest thing ever. And which doesn't mean I'm not safe. I'm incredibly safe with firearms, but I don't have I'm don't have the income to go train and take a week off and go like right. with some of these like you know Grantham kind of lives up here too, and a lot of big YouTubers live in Washington, and so uh, you know I can't take any of these classes. I can't afford it. So I think the first things I started off with were every night for the first two months of gun ownership of each gun I own, I take it apart put it back together like 10 times a night and I just rack it see and I have like the little red bullets the fake ones and I just rack it make sure like I understand the mag I know what to do like I just I want to make sure I'm clearing my functions and I just do that for hours for two months right. <laughs> every night just to make sure I understand my firearm because I think you know if you pull out a knife but you don't know how to cut somebody What's the point? Right. You know, so you, somebody pulls out a bat, but now the other person takes the bat from you. Right. Now you just gave, a, so gave you, something to somebody else. Do you dry fire at all? Yeah, I, I, I do everything. Okay. I just, yeah. I, I think it's all worth it. You have to understand your trigger. You have to understand where you pull. Like, I pull a little to the right. It is what it is. So, well, if you can, you just have to. If you can put the scratch together, I think it's about 100 bucks um, for a Mantis. It's one of our sponsors, by the way. For a Mantis Firearms training system, it's a, it's it's absolutely will take your dry fire to the next level. It's really, really, really cool, and it's actually a lot of fun as well. If you, judging from the way you're talking about your love of things mechanical, um, it's it's a really neat thing. It's it's actually it's kind of like it turns dry fire into like playing a, a fun video game, um, and it oh, really nice. will improve your accuracy and, and your um your splits and your time to first shot. Anyway, I've seen the commercials. I think I've seen every one of the okay. what's called. 
active self-protection videos. Okay. All like 2,500 of them. I, I work from home, so I just watch YouTube all day. Right on. <laughs> I'm bored as hell. Well, and that's the other thing is, you know, we our extra channel is there for a reason. Um, it's it, There's a lot of really good free information on there for like sort of free training that, um, you know, I, I hope people avail themselves of if you can't afford to go out and get uh, one on one or, you know, a class that stuff's on YouTube. It's there for free. So I hope people are taking advantage of it. Um, they put a lot of work into that, that extra channel. So I recently only, only recently got um, a set of body armor <laughs> and me and my friend go on hikes, like, like six hour hikes into the woods at night in the day and fully aren't because here, you know, you can, there's private land and stuff. And he has, you know, some private land. It's a tree farm. And we just kind of just go on a hike and like run a few drills, but it's all dry fire. No, like, no, we don't go live at all, but it just, it gets you pulling. It gets you fatigued with your firearms. Like, I think that's the main thing is and watching your guys' channel and stuff and like watching other YouTube channels, but mainly your guys' and like donut operator is you have to see it. You have to see how much it sucks to be in that position. Right. You have to hear it. You have to hear from the people. It's like nobody wants that to ever happen and it never happens when you want it to happen like i didn't think it would happen to me out of all the people like i'm the least intimidating person so to me it's kind of just yeah you learn. don't <laughs> you, you don't strike me as the kind of person who's who's out there looking for to start fights and, and get in trouble so let's talk about the incident itself you said this happened about december 5th of last year 2021 um, what were you doing that day where were you and, and why were you there so it was my friend's birthday uh we we're at another friend's house it was just three of us um having a bonfire it was kind of early it was like 10 in the morning or, or 10 in the day sorry 10 in the afternoon and i just woke up <laughs> <No problem>. <laughs> but <laughs> uh it was just really early like early in the uh early in the night and we're just like we have this bonfire raging and it's kind of wet here so we don't care leaving this and let's go grab some euros we love euros my friend just he he got a free one for his birthday on like the app or whatever. Right. And so you know, I hop in the car, go down the street, it's like five minutes away. And it's a relatively safe area and it's kind of a main street. So it's like two really main crossings. And so you expect like, I've never heard of like violence, anything going on there. Cause it's so like kind of active with police, things like that. And we kind of show up and we're pulling in and there's a car following us and i'm not really noticing because i notice that stuff when i'm more on the passenger driver's side i'll check the mirrors and i'm, I'm a super self-aware person mm -hmm. and i just like always pay attention to everybody at all times uh and i said a joke to my friend and he does this stupid thing the stupidest thing and he makes obnoxious laughs they're super loud and super annoying and if he hears this podcast he knows what i'm talking about okay. And I'm in the backseat, and I say the joke as we're getting out of the car, right? And he's the driver. He gets out, and he just does this laugh. Ah, like super loud. I'm like, <laughs> what the hell? Why? And this car was behind us. Like, we pull in, and we park, and this car just slips past our left side. But they're, like, just milking it, like, super slow. And he hops out and is laughing. And I don't know what happened, but all we hear is, like, murmurs from the car. Like, we don't know what they're saying, but we don't really – care or like we don't know they might be yelling at each other can you tell how many people are in the car i think it was two but okay yeah i think it was two no idea who they were never met them in my life and there was um, no interaction um, nobody cut anybody off nobody flipped anybody the bird so okay so you have no idea who these people are so they're slow rolling by you and you can't quite make out what they're saying what happens then uh so they're just like murmuring stuff like and we just overlook it as it could be anything like you know, we practically live in Portland now, so it could be anything. Right. People are weird. People are on drugs. Like, what can, and they drive. That's crazy. <laughs> but, you know, you'd be surprised. It's like people are crazy people. And so we just, like, walk in, and I kind of – that's what made me aware of the vehicle, and I'm immediately just tracking it. And so we just, like, walk in, and it's just a glass, glass building with a little shop inside for Euros. And we hop in, and – you know, we order our stuff. I'm kind of noticing this car whipped it in the parking lot. I'm like, ah, oh, shit, they want, they want to fight. Oh, my God. You know, crap, it's going to happen. And three minutes go by, and they're just sitting behind our parked car, like, 
just so, blocking us in practically. So their car right is almost blocking front. your car in. You can't. You couldn't leave if you wanted to. C- couldn't do anything, and they're just right there between. Their car split between our car and the car next to us, where they can see up between. And like, there's a window there. All the good, like, it's just like perfect. And I know they're there, and my friends haven't noticed. And I'm like, hey guys, I'm the only one with the gun. Um, and one of them has two kids, and the other one it's his birthday. So I was like. Give me the keys. I'm gonna pretend to go grab my wallet and just like de-escalate, see what's going on. Like, I was just expecting them to cuss me out, and I'd be like, "I'm sorry, guys. I don't know what the hell you want from me, but I'm just some guy ordering a euro." Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I just like open up the door, and you can kind of see it in the video. And I walk out, and this guy just like waves me down, and goes, "Yo," I'm like, I you know, full attention to him, fully turned towards him, and all I hear is you're laughing at us or, or laughing at me or something along oh, those lines. Okay. Or who do you think you're like, la- or I think you said, who the, do you think you're laughing at? I'll give you something to laugh about before I can say anything. Like before I'm like, I like walked out of the shop, you know, and I'm like, what the heck? And he just reaches over into his passenger side where like, I can see the legs of his friend or whatever. And just starts pulling out what, looks to me like an AK, but it's still long form. Like it's still like a stick and I know what it is. I'm not dumb. So I instantly hop behind the hood of the car, uh, my friend's car. And just, I just drop down and I just, you know, while I'm dropping, grab my gun and rack it just to make sure and just pop back up and just put a red dot on his head. And all I had to say at the moment was let's go mother effort. Wow. <laughs> And I was was like, let's just go, like, just do it. Just make the first move instantly. Like, and I'm one of those people when my adrenaline hits, I'm just serious 100%. Like, I'm just indifferent to emotions. I'm just, let's go. Like, Mm -hmm. I just get, I get this, like, super clarity of mind type situation. And he just puts it down and drives away. (laughs) You said you drew and you you worked the slide. I think you told me beforehand that when you – when you rack the slide, it wasn't until after you racked the slide you realized you already had a round in the chamber. Is that right? I think I knew. It's just, it's instinct from just, I do like, I'll be watching TV and I'll like have my holster set up and I'll like pull it out and rack it and go. And it's more of a, no matter what, I feel like everyone should know the gun they're pointing at somebody is loaded. Because if you're pointing at somebody, your intentions are the worst, right? So why would I point a gun at somebody <laughs> and not back it up with what it's what it means, you know? Like I think um this is just my two cents as a firearms instructor. I would train to always have a round in the chamber and just have that sort of have that knowledge in my head before, you know, before I start. So he's uh you you've come up from behind the car, you've aimed the gun at the guy. Do you think he saw the gun right away? I just had a red dot on his face. That was okay. Like, he just looked at me, and, like, he was aiming the wrong way. Like, he was aiming, like, three, like five, ten feet away from me towards the door, kind of. And he just had it like this. And I'm more, like, even more to the left, kind of where his pillar is. And so, so so this is an audio podcast. So when you say he had it like this, describe how he was holding it for the, for the listeners. He was holding it out the window, but he wasn't aiming it at all. And plus, I was behind his, like, his door pillar. Okay. And so he can see me, but it's going to be harder for him to point at me than me just to ring off a shot at him or cuz I was just going to go. Like if if he made any movement that wasn't put that gun down, which he just like he just tucked it up into the air and then back in and just put it down and okay. drove away. And it's crazy. Did this guy strike you as a gang member or a criminal of some kind or just some rando i mean what was your sense of him and in, in the vehicle he was in i think i think the main thing i learned from your guys's channel and a lot of other channels is ego battles uh-huh. and so i don't know if he was a gang member i'm assuming he was i don't think about portland and vancouver is everyone's a gang member right. <laughs> like, everyone's a tweaker so like he could have been whacked up on some drug or just looking for a fight and just driving around with his homie and just like just ready to go for no reason and 
that's kind of how it is um, in the more recent years here. People are just looking to pop off in a sense. They're just like, they're just ready to go. Like they don't care who you are, where you came from. Like I think a few months ago or like a year ago, someone it was like a fight between two people and somebody just walked up and shot one of them in the head who was trying to break up the fight for no, like it's just psychopath. Like you can't, I don't know if he was a gang member. He sounded like he was just, I mean, he was driving like a blacked out BMW, but it could have been stolen. That's the thing. Right. About yeah. Like so, there's so many stolen cars here. So after, after he pulls off, what, what happens then? What do you, what, what happens with you and, and what do your friends have to say? <laughs> well, the first thing I do is I'm just like, right when he starts pulling off, I immediately go to ready and I'm just like, I just put it against my chest, like just slightly. And <laughs> I remember there's a guy to my right taking in fruits <laughs> into the, the shop next door. And I kind of look over and I do a check or, of my surroundings. And I see this guy just standing there with these fruits in his hand. And he's just standing there looking at me. And I just look at him and just put my gun back in my holster. Wow. So, kind of like sit down, pick up my round. My rounds are like two and a half dollars a piece. They're ridiculous hollow points. And I was just like... Oh, man, I can't lose that. Pick that up, uh, throw it in my pocket. And then I immediately just like went into the shop and was like, can you call 911? And the lady came out and gave us our euros and I, I left all my information and I was like, well, we got to go. I, I don't hang out anywhere. And I think that was one of the cardinal mistakes I did was I didn't call the police myself, okay. but I was just, I just, my only brain was set on, just leave, like get out of there. He can come back. You're in a glass shelter. And I just, I was like, we got our euros. Let's just get out of here. And the cops will call me, ask for it. It's not like they're going to come back because they're not like self defenders and there's video. And I was just, I knew everything in a sense would be handled without like me having to do much. Right. And like the cops called like two and a half hours later. So did the, the police did end up contacting you though? You did talk to them? Yeah, I was driving home from my friend's house. They um, they said some stuff that surprised me because I have some friends on the force and it wasn't like my friend or something, but the gentleman that did call me, he was like, I saw the video. Uh, you did the right thing, but I just want, I don't want you to have like any guilt. You could have, you could have done anything and got away with it at that point. And I was like, I'm, I'm glad I could have, but I think the biggest thing is I was listening to the podcast where the guy saves the cop from getting his head bashed in. Mm -hmm. And he was talking about that moment beforehand where you get this instance of, I'm about to make a decision that changes my life. And that second that I dropped down and racked my gun just to make sure I'm ready to go, so many things went through my head. I was like, there's, there's five, 10 people behind me in a glass shelter. That's my backdrop, not his backdrop, my or that's I guess that's his backdrop. Right, like yeah. If he shoots, that's what's behind me. Right. And that's what, one of the one of the reasons I was like, I'm not shooting until he does, because I, if I have a shootout, I have friends in there. Like, if he's just threatening me, I'd rather just be like, we point guns at each other and he just leaves, because it's like he knows I'll shoot if he shoots, and I just all I can think about is <laughs> crap everyone else like that's the first thing that went through my brain and then i think the next thing was i have i'm going up against a rifle uh i kind of accepted dying that day i was like all right this is it let's go like that's when i stood up i was like let's go like that was my last thought and another one was just i have my uh uccaa whatever uscca mm -hmm. license or uh, insurance so I was like, good on that part. So I just kind of ran through everything in a sense, accepted death and stood up. And I think that was one of my biggest mistakes was I stood up and between me was glass of the top of the car. And it's a short, like little car, like little Acura. And if he shot, he would, I have nothing. I have nothing to block me. And I think the best thing and what I've been kind of trying to practice recently what is moving while taking out my firearm at the same time that's a big thing because i should have ran around the right side and got even more behind his pillar 
and then I would have like super mega advantage on him, and then like then I can make actual my threats mean something because like, he can't even get his gun at me because I'm behind his pillar. He can't even point it. I mean, he could he could just ring off a few shots, but I think movement is was a big thing that I. I was really disappointed in myself. That's something you can work into your dry fire as well. Even if you just go into a range and just just hitting paper targets, uh, nothing says you can't. You know, at, at when you make the decision to draw and aim, uh, move your feet, take a step to the right, take a step to the left, just a little step, something, just to get that ingrained in your head that hey, I want to be moving my feet as this as this drill is going on. Uh, we call it getting off the X. There's you know a bunch of ways to put it, but that's that's the general idea. I got to say, for someone who has only had one eight-hour CCW class, and, of course, the, the benefit of uh, a number of actor self-protection YouTube. <laughs> videos. Years <yeah>. of YouTube. <laughs> well, I mean, look, you know, w watching watching a video on YouTube where someone's breaking down uh, a gunfight or a defensive encounter, I, I consider that a mental rep. That's a rep. You know, you're, you're getting reps in, uh, even if it's not, you're not physically manipulating a firearm. But what I was going to say is, for someone who um, hasn't been uh, law enforcement or a military and hasn't, you know, been through a bunch of training, the the nitpicks that I would have with what you described to me really are that they're just nitpicks. They're just small, you know, things like rack, racking the slide unnecessarily is something I would I would uh, warn you against. But in this event, it didn't make that much of a difference as it turns out. And the fact that you uh, you know, even bother to look for some kind of cover is probably um, unusual for someone with as little experience as you have. So I think on the whole, I, I would say you handled that about as well as you possibly could, given given your experience level. Now, uh, as I think I mentioned at the top, this this it, there is a video that accompanies this story and it will be on the channel. Uh, so we're going to coordinate this podcast release with the release of that video. So people can go watch that on the main channel as John's going to break that down and um you know, talk about uh, what what he sees, and that's that is definitely his wheelhouse, his bailiwick. Um, breaking down those videos, he's done it a lot, uh, and I'm relatively new to that on on the badge cams, but uh, but I'm kind of getting the idea. You know, we talk about sane, sober, moral, prudent people being in the right place at the right time and making sound decisions. So the question at that moment when you're drawn down to this guy is, can I? Should I? Must I shoot? You know, and the the fact that you took a moment and go, okay, well, he's putting it away. You know, I don't need to pull the trigger right now. You could have. The cop told I you. I could have got much. away with anything. I could have had two ear or teardrops under my eye yeah. tattooed. You know, <laughs> like I could have. I could have literally put him and his friend down. But it's the crazy things you think about. Like now, I carry an extra mag. Right. Because I have I have the Glock 48, and it comes with 10, but the S15 gives you 15. And so I have 15 rounds, and I was like, if I put 15 in there, now I don't have any bullets. <laughs> so tell the, tell the folks who may not know, Glock 48, what caliber and what size is that? It's a 9, and it's a subcompact. It's a, it's just, it's like a little pistol. It's like the 43 and the 43X, but just a little longer slide. And mine has a red dot on it. It does not have an identifier. It does not have a uh, flashlight, or yeah, flashlight. Unfortunately, I'm going to buy one soon. Uh, that would have been nice to flash him a little bit with. So when you say but, when you say red dot, is is it a, a laser a laser uh, pointer indicator or a red dot rear on top of the slide? Okay, yeah. I got you. So so you get a, a red dot optic on your on your firearm. Yeah. Okay. Red I got dot you. optic. I, I don't believe in lasers. <laughs> yeah, I'm not a big fan myself. Um, no, some some people like them. That's you know good for them. That's, I'm just not a fan of of laser. Uh, I think anything within that range, I can pretty much hit them without a laser. So. Plus, I mean, you break out a laser, you put it on your target. There, you know, and any cat in the area might jump on the bad guy and get in the way. Um, <laughs> so that's always a concern. They might not understand the seriousness of the situation. Yeah, I think one of the main things was when I left, I had like one really common response and one not really common response to my situation, and. I don't know how to feel about them because I think they're both wrong as hell. Okay, talk, walk us through that. What do you mean by that? I think a few people were immediately like, I would have killed them. I would have done this. I would have uh -huh. teabagged them. Like, you know, just the craziest stuff. Like, they, they were like, I would have punched her mother. Like, you right. know, they're just like, I would have done the most, essentially. Mm -hmm. I would have done any, everything and anything and all of the above. And I just don't 
think they understand what it's like to know that there's 10 people might be 10 people behind you that could get hit and AKs don't they put people down they don't they don't just like you know you take one through the arm and you're like ah oh, it's fine it's just a nine you know I'm just gonna go to the hospital it's people die really fast and like really fast and I didn't have my first aid it wasn't in my, I have it in my car don't have not my car my friend drove me here right. um so I don't have first aid uh I have a significantly smaller caliber. I don't have enough rounds if I miss, which I don't think I would, but people stay alive. That's fine. You know, 50 cent took nine rounds. He's still here. And if I miss like, or his friend pops out and I only hit him once and he starts opening, what, what do I do if I just put 15 rounds in it and I'm empty? Now I'm just like, not only am I a target, they have a lot of reason to be upset with me. <laughs> like, they have like so much reason to be extremely upset with me. And so mainly, mainly you don't realize the, like, the things that go through your brain in five seconds. Because when, when I walked out of that store, I knew I could die and I knew I was sacrificing myself for the people behind me just to take care of this issue. Because if all three of us walked out with euros in hand, like in in AK points out, what am I gonna do? Now I'm just even if I duck and cover, my friends right there, my other friend like, you know, we're just sitting ducks and so I I you have to make these conscious decisions that it's not always about you and what you wanna do. It's everyone around you mm -hmm. because their back like my backdrop on them is concrete nothing behind me is what I was worried about and now I'm talking to the lady who makes my Euro euros and towards like a relationship and so it's like you don't ever know who's behind you and what if him trying to hit me hurt her my friend has two kids you know there's parents there's I don't even, I didn't know if there's kids you know I wasn't really paying attention to that but there's a whole back of the store I'm not even take that's just considering the right. front of the store what's so interesting about this this story is the fact that you guys were you couldn't have been less looking for trouble if you were trying to less to look for less trouble than you were looking for you were just getting food and this guy with a fragile ego and and a rifle is li quite literally looking for an excuse to to uh, to mess with somebody who knows if he meant it with a rifle who knows if he just wanted to scare you and you know make you put your tail between your legs or if he was actually considering shooting at you but you know, the, the idea that you have to switch from, man, I'm hungry and really want this delicious gyro to, uh, oh, crap, I may have to get in a gunfight uh, in which I'm outgunned AK to 9 mil um, that yeah. quickly is, I think it's it's absolutely commendable. So after this is, is all over, you know, this guy bails out. They, they take off. Uh, you get out of there with your friends. You get back to I, – did you go back to the house with a bonfire? What's going on? And what what happens then? What are you yeah, guys talking about? I, I went back to the bonfire and grabbed a glass of whiskey and a beer. I was like, what? Because I was shaking. I, yeah. I'm one of those people where I can adrenaline dump and I'm fine. You know, clear clarity of mind. I can – I get really serious. I've watched people get extremely injured at construction. I was a superintendent, so I was really – I've seen some stuff. I've seen people get extremely injured by all sorts of tools mm -hmm. and tools aren't fun. Industrial accidents. And so, yeah. And so to me, when I see blood, when I see damage, I'm the guy you kind of want because I know first aid, I know CPR. I, you know, I know how to put on a tourniquet and I understand that you don't want to be asked how you're doing. <laughs> right. It's the biggest thing is when you're hurt, somebody asks how you're doing. I'm like, just shut up. No, that's it shut up they don't want to hear anything like i was just shaken I, I couldn't sleep i didn't sleep that night it traumatized me for like two months after i i didn't i probably got like two to three hours of sleep every night i would think about what would happen if i killed them a lot like a lot sometimes i regret it sometimes i don't sometimes i think what if what if they did that to somebody else and now those people are dead and we don't know because they stole a different car or something. And I have this philosophy in life. It's it's just, you know, if you, you have to stop a racist from raping again, right? And so you have to do, you know, whatever legally you can.
but if you just let them go and say, well, I don't want the social pressure or something, which, which happened to me in my life personally, uh, it's, you have to stop these people. And that's a guilt I'm going to live with for the rest of my life. I didn't stop an evil person, but in stopping this evil person, I could have killed beautiful people. And so it's like, (laughs) I'm such a black and white person. Like I I think everything's black and white. I don't think there's no gray area, but this is a gray area. Yeah. So to me, I like, I think I made the right decision. The gray area in life, uh, like wisdom comes with age. So the older you get, the more life experience you have, the more you'll see that there's a lot of gray area there. And I think, I think you can put your mind at ease as far as your decision making, because based on what you're describing to me, um, if, if you challenged him with a firearm and he put his away and drove off, there really isn't much you could have done. I mean, you sure could you have, but would you feel, you know, would you be able to sleep better now? having pulled the trigger at that moment, I, I, I would tend to think not. I think you did what uh, you had to do. When it comes to the must I aspect of must I shoot, um, I think the answer was no, you didn't have to, and therefore you didn't, and I think that's probably was the, was the right call. So uh, moving forward, do you plan on um, in the future trying to get more training, uh, trying to be, you know save some money for classes? What's the, what are you thinking about that? Well, my life plan is uh, might be a little different than others. I'm hopefully about to close on a triplex, and I just – it kind of kicked this whole situation with not sleeping a lot. actually kicked off something in me, and I have, like, a different view on life now, and so I just – I work a lot. I work, like, 20-hour days now. Or I'm not working sometimes, but I'm, like, always doing something. Mm-hmm. And so I'm definitely thinking about it, but I'm thinking in a year or so because right now – Right now, I think I can handle myself. I'd love to be like the greatest gunfighter there ever was, but uh, right now I just I don't have the time. I do have the money, I just don't have the time. And it's mainly you know life gets in the way, and I just I'm just living it. I still do everything I do. Like I still train myself at home, and with this experience, I think I think I kind of proved myself to myself that I'm not just like some you know idiot with a gun you know, making mistakes. The the craziest thing is people just start shooting. And I think the main thing is I didn't. And I, that's the most commendable thing is I didn't just start blasting and without no regard for anything. I think the biggest thing was regard for everyone. Right. So, well, Igor, I mean, I want to thank you for reaching out to John um, and sharing your story with us, sharing the video with us. And for the folks listening, just remember to uh, go over to the main actor self-protection channel. And when this show is up, that video should be live. We're going to coordinate, try to release them both around the same time. Uh, Igor, uh, I would commend you for your actions that day. I think you did, especially with your lack of experience in training, I think you did a really, really outstanding job uh, covering your ass and your friends behind you. Uh, I think you displayed really good decision making. And I definitely want you to consider buying a, a Manus training system because I'm that that just that multiplies your dry fire. That time when you're sitting in front of the TV or or whatever, you a little bit of downtime, man. It's it's just it's fun. I take to do. donations. Yeah. <laughs> Donate to my OnlyFans. <laughs> okay. I'll talk to John about that. All right, <laughs> all right, Igor, man. Hey, thanks so much for being on. And um, you know, if you need anything from us, man, uh, hit us up. Let us know. Thank you guys so much. All right, folks, you know what time it is. The episode is over. Therefore, it's time for the Gutowski file starring our very own Stephen Gutowski. He is the founder of the reload.com and the host of the weekly reload podcast. You can find that on all of your finer podcast networks and the whole show plus clips on YouTube. That's absolutely free. Doesn't mean you shouldn't get a membership. Do not steal the milk from under the fence, folks. Make sure you give Stephen a couple of bucks. so you can keep doing what he's doing. Stephen, welcome. How are you, sir? Yeah, plus you get it a day early if you buy a membership. There you go. There's another benefit. So we are talking this week, none other than Beto O'Rourke. He says, and I'm going to quote here from the article, I'm not interested in taking anything from anyone. What I want to do is defend the Second Amendment. And then in my notes, I wrote LOL, because that's preposterous. Uh, This is a man who came right out before, during his campaign in 2016, I believe it was, uh, and said, uh, you're damn right, I want to take your AR-15s to AK-47. So, Stephen, 
has he seen the light? Is he now one of us? Is he now a gun supporting uh, member of the NRA, a Second Amendment supporter? Do you think he's changed uh, his his opinion altogether? Well, uh, it seems that's what he wants people to believe in Texas. Uh, it's a pretty stark contrast between his 2019 comments where he said, hell yes, we're going to take your AR-15, your AK-47. Uh, and now when he's saying, I, literally, I'm, quote, not interested in taking anything from anyone. Hmm. So, uh, you know, obviously it's very hard to, to square those two positions or those two comments uh, because they're literally polar opposites of one another. So uh, the, the weirder thing to me, to be honest with you, is not that he's doing this, that not that he's, you know, flip-flopping on this. Obviously politicians do this constantly from all parties and they, they're constantly triangulating or completely reversing themselves on previous positions when right. they're not popular anymore. And in Beto's case, he's gone from running in the, Democratic presidential primary to running in the, the Democratic Texas gubernatorial primary, primary, which is very different audiences, mm -hmm. I would imagine. Um, so I, I think most people thought he would have to do this reversal at some point if he wanted to have any chance of actually getting within 10 points of uh, the incumbent governor, Greg Abbott, who's a Republican in Texas. So the weird part to me is the timing. You know, why, why is he doing this several months after he announced the his campaign? Why didn't he do it before he announced the campaign? It's just such a weird thing. Like, I, you know, I, I'm not sure how many people are going to really buy this, first of all, or if there was ever going to be much of a chance for, that people would buy this whenever he made this reversal. But it, it's especially ridiculous now that he has doubled down on it previously in this exact campaign it was such an inartful way to do it to go from the one extreme to another extreme rather than trying to maybe strike a balance or find a middle ground to act as though he went from i want to take all your guns to i, I want to defend the second amendment just seems like i don't know he i know he's an odd guy to begin with but it just seems like a bit of a uh like well, i said inartful and in, in, in like an exaggeration i'm not sure how to put this exactly but you think you know what i'm yeah. talking about well, I get, I get what you mean in terms of like the literal comments here is such an obvious contrast to go from hell. Yes. We're going to take your AR 15, your AK 47. We're not going to allow you to be, we're going to allow it to be used against our fellow Americans anymore to saying, I'm not interested in taking anything from anyone. What I want to make sure is that we do is defend the second amendment. Those are obviously such stark contrasts That doesn't make any sense. But what I will note is what Beto O'Rourke means by defending the Second Amendment is probably not what you or I might mean when we say that. Is that the thing here is, I'm not sure his position has changed all that much. Now, outside of not wanting to literally confiscate AR-15s and AK-47s, he still opposes people owning them. And uh, it's not entirely clear from his website exactly what policy he wants to implement, I did reach out to his campaign to see if they were going to give specifics on his new policy or what, what he actually wants to do about AR-15s and AK-47s now. But I would imagine he's probably still for an assault weapons ban, you know, ban on sales, on new sales, uh, which is what the general position has been since the 90s for most Democrats. But uh, it's just, you're right in certainly right in the sense that rhetorically what he actually said is is very weird way of doing this um probably because he did this these comments are coming from a, a campaign stop where he was answering a question from someone it seems like he's been going around in his in the campaign talking about other issues and not guns for the last couple of months sure he hasn't really made any news on on the gun front in, in since really the end of november when was the last time he really doubled down on the gun confiscation policy. Uh, so it seems like he's been focused more on energy and going after Abbott for, you know, the power outages that they had during the, the winter storm there in Texas. And he hasn't been talking about this. And this only came up as part of a question and answer session during his campaign stop. So that might be why it's not, it, it's so inartfully done, but I don't know that his actual position is, radically different in terms of what policies he supports. Sure. I think it's worth noting, too, that uh, Texas Democrats, at least ones that have been there for more than five years, are not like New York or California Democrats. They tend to be 
the Overton window there is still close enough to the middle that a, t- a Democrat in Texas is still to the right of most Democrats other places, and most of them, or many of them, I'm sure, uh, care about the Second Amendment. So I get why right. he's doing it. I just don't get the, uh, the, the how. The implementation seemed a bit ham-handed and clunky <laughs> to me. Yeah, I think that's a fair assessment of what he literally said. Now, he's fi- he's shifted his focus on guns as well to criticizing Abbott for signing permitless carry into law in Texas. Uh, that And to be fair, that's not new. He's, he, do, he was doing that at the end of November as well. It's just that now he's taken out the gun confiscation part of it, and he's focused on trying to attack Abbott as the extremist on guns, um, which obviously when he did that in November, it didn't make a lot of sense because he was literally on the extreme end of the left in terms of gun policy while he was decrying Abbott for being an extremist. So uh, I guess now that's more in line, but uh, it comes at the cost of just making this an incredibly obvious flip-flop. Now that we have these little talks every week for the past few months, I'm starting to get the impression that politicians will say anything to get elected. <laughs> anyway. You're just, folks, you're just getting that, uh, I mean, that impression now? I'm new at this. I, I'm just getting the idea <laughs> that maybe they'll just say whatever, and uh, they may or may not mean it, folks. i got to warn you, so make sure you pay attention to what these <laughs> folks are saying if they follow through or not. Folks, if you are lamenting the lack of down-the-middle fair, same sober reporting on the Second Amendment and all things guns, Go over to TheReload.com, TheReload.com, and check it out. Consider getting a membership. Share that link with some of your friends to get them involved so they can uh, people can start to get the sort of news they're not getting anywhere else. To include Fox or CNN or any other places. So a lot of this stuff is exclusive to Steve and his organization, so uh, we're, we're super proud of his work over there and to be associated with TheReload.com. Uh, don't forget to check out the Weekly Reload podcast on all of your finer podcast outlets and YouTube. Steven, thanks for being here, buddy. Hey, thanks for having me. Hey, friends, this is John Correa. If you like the podcast, if it is bringing you value, do me a favor. Just rate the podcast and leave us a rating and a review. It really helps us out. 